to, to our faith may grow and prosper. And as we continue to journey into new ventures in this wonderful book, uh, the book of Hebrews, uh, may, may you just give us expanded faith, uh, Lord, in each person's life. Make this a message that's applicable and practical as we understand maybe a little bit more in a different way uh, of the greatness of our God. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I uh, know if you've heard the story of a businessman that was uh, troubled about an upcoming important deal that he had with the company, and so he went to church to pray for God to help him. And uh, this business, by, by chance, knelt down uh, to a gentleman who was praying for $100 for, to pay an urgent debt. So overhearing the poor man's prayer, he got out his wallet and he took $100 and he pressed it into the man's hand. Uh, overjoyed, the man got up and he left the church. The, the businessman uh, then slowly uh, prayed with his eyes closed and said, And now, Lord, that I have your undivided attention, let me ask you, what gets God's attention? What, what enables God to respond maybe much more personally, quickly, than, than you think in your life? What really gets God's attention that would be able to do that? And that's what we're talking about here in Hebrews chapter 11. Well, the verses that we read to us here in verses 1 and verse 6, and, and uh, others that we will uh, project uh, as we talk about the characteristics of a living faith. There are three uh, salient points, or three, three main points, that I want you to receive from here that will help as we look at the faith that we're needed in these times. I believe in Hebrews chapter 1, first of all, that faith is active because it's alive. The first characteristic that is lifted that the Hebrew writer is speaking about here that I believe is that faith is active because it's alive. In other words, this faith, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It tells us clearly in here that faith is a present tense faith. It's a moving faith. It's exciting. It's up to date. So the Hebrew writer is speaking about a faith that is moving. It's active. Now faith is. You see, the Hebrew writer is not talking about yesterday, what yesterday's faith was. It's not talking about what tomorrow's faith will be. It says, now faith is. Let's do a little experiment. Let's do a little test here. You have your Bibles. If you put your finger on the word now, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare ask you to use white on the tape. We're not to add or distract from God's word. But you put your finger on the word now. What do, you, what do you have there? You have a beautiful definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things yet not seen. So you have a beautiful definition of faith. So why is the word now there? Because that little word now makes faith active. Without that little word, we don't have anything moving. We don't have anything leaving. We don't have anything that has breath to it. But all of a sudden, we understand what? That that little word now shows us the timing of our faith. Do you, do you see there? Now faith is. You have a wonderful definition, but you don't have anything that's active, moving, exciting, doing something. Don't you need faith that does something for you? That's what the Hebrew writer is getting. That's, it's, it's exciting to know that the faith that we have can do something for us today. Not tomorrow, not when the answer comes. Oh, we need that answer, right? But we need for it to do something in our life today, right now, in there. And so this present tense faith is not talking about yesterday what we had, or talking about tomorrow, because if you're talking about uh, tomorrow, you may be talking about hope, but you're not talking about faith. You're talking about yesterday, right? You're talking about what happened yesterday. But the Hebrew writer says that faith is active, exciting, moving, up to date now. 
In fact, listen to what Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Jesus says, King James Version says, truly, truly, uh, the NIV says, therefore, I say to you all things for which you pray and ask and believe, believe that you have received them and they shall be granted to you. So in other words, Jesus is again talking in Mark 11 of a present tense, moving, exciting, up-to-date faith. If you believe it now, and you're asking for it now, it will be granted to you in the future. So you have to believe it in the now. You have to believe it in the active part of your life, where it's active and it's alive now, to receive something from God tomorrow. So my belief now, my faith now, is going to activate to receive those promises from God, to receive those things you're looking for in there. It does something to you. There's all types of illustrations of that type of faith that we need in life. And you see, that type of faith that's present tense and active, what does it do for you? I believe it changes your attitude now. It changes your actions now. It changes your spirit now. It changes your outlook now. Are you allowing this virus, this pandemic, are you allowing it to shift your outlook, your attitude? Is your attitude less than what it should be? Is your outlook dim and gloomy and fearful? God is saying you have to have a faith that believes that it's going to affect your attitude now, your outlook, your spirit, your reactions to things. I sense there may not be many, but there's some that's allowing this to circumvent the faith that you need that's going to give you what you're looking for as we progress through here. You need a faith in the now. Look at verse 6 that I read to you. It says, For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Let me ask you, who comes to God? Who comes to God? The person who sees him who he is, right? Who, who seeks God? The person who he is. Not who he was, not who he will be, but who he is right now in our life. You see, it, we're not, at some point we'll talk about Enoch, but you notice verse 5 that, that I believe that, that Adam and Eve in the garden they didn't have to have faith there before the fall, did they? they? They didn't need any faith, correct? Adam and Eve walking with God in the cool, he walked with him in the cool of the evening, in the perfect time, in the right place, in the right attitude, God came, and you don't need any faith for God to talk to you face to face, do you? But after they fell, they sinned, faith now becomes what? Faith becomes the vehicle by which they touch God and communicate to Him. It's that faith that causes us to respond in a proper way to God so that what we are dreaming and anticipating and longing for it will be met down the road. But it's got to do something for us now, doesn't it? It's not, as I say, tomorrow or the day now. It has to do something in your life right now. And we shouldn't allow anybody to steal that. So I believe the reality of us touching God is as alive and sure and certain in our life as our faith is to God. The one translation says of this, that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. It says that nobody reaches God's presence until he has learned to believe. So basically, my faith will determine my motivation for what I do tomorrow, right? The faith you have today determines what you're going to do tomorrow. I remember in, in high school, uh, I'm short, I'm uh, I lost, I think I lost an inch, I'm five, was five seven, I think now I'm probably a five six, the last, so I guess as you get older, it starts shrinking, but I had a friend that was six four, and he was on the basketball team, well, he, during the summer time, he, you would have the opportunity to go to summer camp, 
But my friend, he said, I'm not going to summer camp this year. And I said, well, why aren't you going? You know, he was a wonderful uh, uh, point guard and, and, a, and a great athlete. And he says, well, I'm not going because I won't make the team. So what, what, was, he, what was he saying in there? He responded today accordingly to what he thought would happen tomorrow. He responded today how he believes what's going to happen tomorrow. What about you? How is your prayer life? How is your time spent with God? How are you developing your growth in your life? You see, if you don't have a vital prayer life, if you're not desiring to have more of God in your life, and whatever steps you're taking, I can say to you, your faith is either dying or dead. If you don't have that drawing in that, that's not critical, that's not any, it's just is that God is there. We have the avenue. So even though we're not meeting a church here, you, where you're at in, in various ways, you can grow. There's all types of ways in that. But I know through the years people say, well, I can't do anything. I don't have any gifts. I can't do this. So, you know, I, yeah, I can do that too. And say, I can give a whole bag of excuses why I can't. But you see, our faith today, what your motivation today determines what happens tomorrow. You've got to get that today. You've got to trust God and begin to serve Him and begin to flow in that. So faith is active because it's alive. But secondly, faith is secure because it is certain. There are different translations uh, of that, but I won't read it. I'll just mention one. One that you're very familiar is the King James Version. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, right? The substance of it. So faith gives substance to our hope. And so if you take that word substance, it comes from the Latin two words, right? Sub and stand. And it makes, basically means standing underneath. And so our faith is to provide a firm foundation by which we are standing on firm ground, waiting for that deliverance to come. Faith is the solid ground. It's the firm foundation that we hold on. If you're not standing on solid ground, you're on shifting sand. You're, you're in something that's not going to keep you. You see, our faith should hold us. It should anchor us in our, in our Lord Jesus Christ. I think verse 13 gives us that foundation that they have. It said, all these die in their faith. In other words, their foundation was so sure and certain in their life that they were banking on what's going to happen tomorrow. They're so, so sure of that that they even saw themselves as alien and strangers because their foundation of faith was so strong. I remember uh, when our children, uh, Bridget and Kyle, were small, and I used to hold them in my hand. Yeah. And they, I'd hold my hand and they, they, would, uh, they would put their legs straight, right, as their mother screamed for, to, let, to let them down. She was just jealous because she wouldn't get on that hand. Oh, I better stop, right, because my wife's not here. But yeah, and, and so there would be people who'd come over, you know, and so Rich and Kyle would let them hold them, you know, when they were real small, hold me. You know, why would they do that? Nobody else could do that. There would be friends over and they would try it. No, no way. No. And even though, you know, their dad may be a klutz at times, they knew what? They knew that they're okay. They knew that, that their dad's in control here. He, uh, we're, we're solid. They're secure. That's what God is saying. The faith is a faith believing that God is in control of all things. And he knows how it all is going to work out. Do you have a faith that is rooted and strong now? You know, you might see that everything is just burdens and problems and all that. But even with all of that, you have to have a faith that believes in great things. And then thirdly, faith is enough. If I could say, faith is enough because it is evidence. I think a better translation, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the conviction 
of things not seen. Uh, that's NIV. But faith is the conviction that unseen things exist. I believe that's what the Hebrew writer is really saying here. To get this faith, faith is enough because it is evidenced. It is a conviction that the unseen things exist. Now, we talked about two phrase, phases of faith, right? We talked, what's the first? The substance of faith. The substance of faith is the content and the assurance of a truth. In other words, faith is the nuts and bolts of our faith, right? It's the nuts and bolts of our faith. God told Noah that it was going to rain and build a boat, right? So Noah believed it, what God said, and he did it. That's the substance of, of faith. Noah believed what God said and, and he and he and he trusted that, right? But when Noah went out and got the hammer and got the nails and got the lumber, what is that? That's the conviction of faith. All of a sudden, he not only believed what God said, but now he put faith to the test. He put faith, even though he doesn't see the end result, right? He's somewhere between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. It never rained, as I said last week. So he, he can't see what it is, but he's building that. And we'll talk about that upcoming about Noah, to have a Noah-like faith. Now, I guess next week we will. And we'll look at Noah. But that's what it said. Those two phases we get the substance of it is he heard God and he believed it. And that's the nuts and bolts. That's the content of faith. But when he starts building, he starts doing it, even though he doesn't see the end result of what it's going to be, he begins to act on that. And it's that type of faith that we need in life. It's that conviction uh, in our life and heart. There, uh, I do I wrote down, and there was an old cartoon, and I, I can't show it to you, but basically it's an old one, it's a picture of an ark, and the uh, Noah and all the animals are, are uh, climbing up on the ladder, and his wife is almost there at the door, and he's climbing up, and he's holding two goldfish in a bowl of water. And in the cartoon, it, it says, the wife says, Noah, that shouldn't be necessary. There, there is what I say a natural faith and there's a supernatural faith, right? There's a natural faith that the label uh, on the can, the label on there, that the food, that what you are partaking of, what you've purchased to partake of, that that's what it is, right? You have a natural faith. You go to the doctor and uh, you have surgery. Uh, you go and you believe that natural faith, right? That everything's going to be fine. But once you're in surgery, it's too late after that, right? But let me talk to you just a moment about this conviction of, of faith that believes that the unseen things exist. Let me do a little just on philosophy. I'm not going in, but I need to make this point. There, these unseen things that we don't see, there used to be years ago that, that not theology, but a philosophy of belief called rationalization. And there were even theologians that would, would hop on the bandwagon of, of this rationalization. And what they believed is that, that you could only what you could reason or what you could see or what you could feel or what you could taste, that that is the only valid sense of belief. One philosopher said that there are only 26 verses in all the Bible that were real because it was something you could only feel, touch, taste in there. And so what happened was it caused man, people to be exasperated because it, it, did, it, it just didn't work out because not everything can be put in a test to, not everything can be reasoned or sensed and feel. And so mentally he, he men could handle that, but his soul and spirit was reaching up for something you couldn't always taste or feel in there. But then it began to do a flip side. It went from reason and have to feel God and touch Him that unless I see it, I, I'm not going to believe it. Well, then it went from a 
to a contentless faith. What I mean is, it went from just a leap of faith where you believe and you believe and you believe and you believe. No anchor, no foundation, just believe in there. And what happened? Well, what happened is we went wild. It showed up in art till modern art showed up. And we see modern art in some of the extremes of that. I shake my head and I'm, I'm not the best judge of that, but I know there's some art that is, is disgusting, particularly that they'll throw out regarding uh, our, our Lord. Uh, I don't view that as art, I view it as unacceptable in there. Showed up in our music, it showed up in our culture, where our morals were smashed in there. So it went from you gotta, that you got to reason it, you've got to see it, till just all you've got to do is believe and believe and believe in there. But you see, our whole foundation of faith is not just believe and believe in here and believe and believe and believe, but it's a faith that we believe that God is behind all unseen things. God is behind those things that we can't wrap our, our, our mind around sometimes in there. You know, astronomers say there are 100 billion stars in, in one galaxy. 100 billion stars, and there are over 100 million galaxies uh, that they know of. And Albert Einstein said that there's 1 billion times uh, unknown space larger than known space. 1 billion times larger unknown than known. So if there's 100 billion stars in one galaxy, and there's 100 million known galaxies, and there are a billion more unknown space compared to known space. I'll let John put that in his technological knowledge, and I think uh, he's not coming up with the answer. I don't think you have an answer to that. I certainly don't, right? But I do know this, in the beginning God. In the beginning God. Our faith has to look beyond the telescope of the astronomer, the test tube of the scientist, it looks to have to look beyond and say, there is God. God's behind all. God's in control of all that. And so when we begin to see that, that God is behind all of that, it explains everything. It explains uh, evolution. Evolution says the population, and I'm getting, I'm drawing to a close here, the population of the world grows 1% every year. They say that man lived 500,000 years on earth. Now, Christians don't hold that view. Now, there might be some, but m most do not hold that we're on this earth 500,000 years. So someone said that, you know, what they say, I took biology classes after, before I went to college and on to uh, graduate school. And, uh, you know, they uh, said, you know, some guy fell out of a tree and lost his tail and he found a woman. And you think that's, that's quite absurd, but you know, I took a biology class and took philosophy, took those types, and that's what they were still saying. Yeah, man fell out of a tree, lost his tail, and he found the woman. Yeah, deep stuff, isn't it? Isn't it? Deep stuff. So 500,000 years ago, if man was on Earth, and he grows 1% every year, uh, whether this is accurate, that would be 37.2 billion people per square foot. All the Hebrew writer is saying that faith is the conviction that the unseen things that we do not sense, that we don't feel, that we can't reason, that God is behind all of that. So your faith and my faith looks beyond the doubts of the astronomers, whatever it is, the test tube, science, all they do. And we, man can do amazing things. I'm not diminishing, I'm not advocating that cannot. There's amazing tech advancements. I'm not, but I'm saying if our faith isn't grounded on what we can always reason and sense and feel, what about you? Their faith gave approval. They sensed God's approval because the faith they had, even when they can't see it and understand it. And every one of these men and women here in Hebrews 11 mentions, they all had faith, as I said last week. And they, they even had faith when they couldn't see it. They couldn't see the end result, can you? Do you know what's going to come? Let us pray. 
Lord Jesus, teach us that faith is the eye by which we look to you, that faith is the hand by which we lay hold of you. Faith is the tongue by which we can taste just how good you are and faithful in our life. And faith is the foot by which we come to you. Lord, help us that we'll understand that faith is nothing more than you, O oh God, at work in our lives. We think today, Lord, for our church family here in Somerset. We uh, pray for some today that you'll continue your blessing for Debbie and Ken, for losing Jean. Dear, dear Lord, be tender with them. Continue. We, 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 we continue to think. Just, we miss her dearly. We just ask you to help them, to help Ken and De Debbie and the family as they still deal with this. She was a, she was a, a rock. She was solid. And she had a faith. And she had a tenacity to, to express in many ways. And uh, we know she just vital in our church. We think of Doris and and, and we remember Sydney and Calvin and help them as we think just uh, her wonderful faith and how she expressed for years serving in the church and how she uh, even late in life was, was a part of ours. It was kind of short, but, but she still uh, had an indelible imprint and influence upon us. Where we, we do pray for Hazel as we think she has a 15th heavenly for surgery there at Forbes Hospital in Monrovia. We'll be with her, dear Father, that uh, everything will be taken care of here as she has the outpatient surgery for this spot. We pray that you'll touch her and heal her and the, the, out, the outlook and uh, outcome will be positive. It'll be wonderful that, that that answer will be met and that there won't be any cancer uh, for in, in her life. We uh, think that this as yesterday John mentioned for, for uh, uh, Jeff, uh, we, we pray for him that, uh, that you will be with him for the surgery upcoming and, and that you are in control of all of that and help him that he'll be able to gather uh, a renewed strength with you, that his faith and hope in you will be just solid to know that you're going to see him through the surgery safely. We trust that this is, this is small to you, but it looms large. Uh, Lord, for, for Jeff, for his family. We just lift him in prayer for to do that wonderful miracle in his life and heart. We, we pray for our community and we pray for our state as we still are, are under these restrictions, as we desire and hopeful that, 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 that the governor and those uh, that make those decisions and looking at everything, that, that the information, the statistics will will uh, uh, bear out what the, the true uh, estimation and what the true uh, uh, reality is and that they will be able to adjust and do those things that are fair. Uh, we pray for those that are affected, those that have lost uh, in our county and Camry and, and others, those who are still dealing with it. And uh, so we pray in this that we're, we deal with what we have and we help us uh, as we try to gather ourselves with everything and try to assimilate through it, we pray, Lord, that, that our faith won't have, that uh, we won't uh, react and, and react in a, in, in a way that is not honoring you, but to, to react with the, what you would be pleasing to you, Lord, and to be encouraging and uplifting and, and giving people the benefit of the doubt and, and not to, to uh, fly off and not that people are doing, but it's a temptation for us uh, to very quickly just react and to, to express maybe something that we regret. And once we say it, it's so hard we can never take it back. Uh, but we pray in the midst of this that you'll be with your people, be with our family here at Somerset, be with those that have maybe just tuned in, that, uh, Father, there may be something that will lift their spirit and encourage them. Uh, that their faith will, will just rise up to bring great pleasure to you and, and to that answer that they're asking for. So this morning we thank you for the joy of our Lord. We thank you that, Lord, no matter what is around us, no matter what we feel within, Lord, you are still there. Help us to have a faith rooted and grounded, active and alive, certain and secure in you to believe that. Lord, thank you this day. Uh, in the blessed name of our Lord, we pray. Amen.